Jerry McDonald is making an HO layout of New Bedford, Massachusetts in 1954 in a room he built for it, conveniently above his new garage. Jerry developed his track plan using actual railroad blueprints, appropriately scaling down and simplifying a very complex yard and dock. The track extends from the Acushnet River at New Bedford to the Canton Viaduct and on to Boston and Nashua in staging. Jerry asked me to help with the electricity for his layout. He had finished the room and completed the first island of benchwork. Next, he installed the first track, which will become, ultimately, underground staging. There are four parallel tracks on each side, leading to a single track connection at each end. That requires three turnouts at each end, 12 in all, to have control over the four tracks on each side. Already 12 turnouts to control and we weren't even at ground level. There would be a lot more. Further, Jerry wanted signaling, well, semaphores specifically. and the option for dispatcher control. And it would be big. This is the first of three long peninsulas. Before I discuss controlling them, I'd like to talk a bit about Tortoise by Circuitron switch machines. A wonderful invention, now challenged by several imitators, including now servo motors. I am not going to discuss these options, as luckily for me, Jerry had already brought a lot of tortoises. You know how we model railroaders accumulate what we need over years and hopefully have it when we actually need it. So that was what we were going to use. Of course, before Tortoise, there were twin coil solenoid switch machines. I remember control with these Atlas slide switch push buttons. Slide to one side and push, the turnout goes to that side, slide to the other and push, and it's back. Easy to use, and there are even ways to matrix them for a staging yard like this. But solenoids have their own problems, especially the high current required. So the gentle tortoise was a boon, but not easily controlled with a push button. Tortoises are controlled by switching DC voltage polarity on the two outside connections of the edge connector. Plus on one side pushes it one way, reversing the plus and minus and it goes back the other way. It is intended that the current stay connected when thrown to keep pressure on the points. So that means we can't just have a push button control it, at least not directly. To manually control it, we would need a toggle switch wired to reverse the polarity when toggled, or a similarly wired relay, which would then allow push button or contact closure control. Now why do I say contact closure rather than just push button, since where we most often have a contact closure is when we push a button. We're going to see that there are more ways to make a contact closure than just a button, and a lot more things we can do with it. But it is good to remember that push button. Generally, a push button connects to ground when pressed, or when the internal contacts are closed. Connecting the wire to ground sends that ground signal back down the wire to the receiving device, whatever it may be. How does the device see the ground? Well, inputs generally have a pull-up resistor connected to the plus voltage and monitored. If there's no connection on the input, the input sees that plus voltage, or a high, with a small current through the pull-up resistor and waits. The moment someone presses that button, the contact closes and the wire now connects to ground through much less resistance, the wire, than the pull-up resistor. The input now sees the low and tells the device that the input has been activated. I did consider many options for controlling the tortoises. 
For example, these circuits from Rob Paisley. Especially here in the staging yard, which would not necessarily be controlled by a dispatcher, but would need some way of choosing the proper four tortoises to activate a track. Jerry wanted local push-button control panels on each side to control track choice, so whatever we used also had to allow local button input. There are, of course, stationary DCC decoders, which allow control from the DCC cab. Some of them also include the option for adding local contact closures or buttons for turnout and or route control, in addition to DCC control. However, Jerry did not want to have to use the handheld to control turnouts. But he did want, at some point, to have the dispatcher control of mainline turnouts. I wired my layout a few years back and used then state-of-the-art DCC stationary decoders, still available now. It was then called a Team Digital SMD82, so of course now it's up to SMD84. When I chose them, they were the least expensive stationary decoder per output. Each has eight tortoise or twin coil outputs, as well as those necessary local button inputs. We could have gone a similar route here. The SMD84 and many other DCC stationary decoders are available. But I've been following the development of layout command control for several years, especially at the NMRA national conventions. So I had a pretty good idea of what it could do. And the more I thought about it, the more it seemed like the best option for Jerry's layout. Since ultimately some form of dispatcher control would be involved, connecting everything to a network of some sort is necessary. That would allow the use of JMRI or others for signaling and turnout control. But when a dispatcher isn't around, we'd still like to be able to control turnouts, those buttons again, and have the signaling run itself without having to attach and operate a laptop to make it go. And that's where LCC shines. Yes, it does require a computer to set up, contrary to the NMRA ad, sadly. But once loaded, the components create and consume events completely on their own, and we'll get more into that. No attached PC running JMRI is needed to make it go. And even though we're only talking about turnout control here, LCC already is being used for all the rest of this, and more every day. That last item, repeaters, means that there is no limit to the number of nodes on a network, as networks can be linked. I wanted to see if the various tortoise control options were similar in cost, so I gathered some pricing information. First are the DCC stationary decoders. This is by no means a complete list, but a good representative sample. At the top is the Team Digital SMD84 that I mentioned still the best deal per tortoise, and it includes button connections. Next down is the DCC Specialties Wabbit, a dual hair, which also allows button connections, a bit more per tortoise. Then there's the NCE Switch 8, their 8-output stall motor stationary decoder, which is less expensive per tortoise until you add those buttons. Finally, the RR Circuits LCC option with a tower LCC and a stall motor driver board, SMD8, to allow buttons and eight tortoises is in the same cost ballpark. All of the options are within a few dollars per tortoise, so really the cost is not a factor to keep you from choosing LCC. LCC's network is based on the CAN bus that was invented by Bosch for automotive components to talk to each other. It is a very robust network designed to function well in a moving vehicle with lots of interference. It is similar to Ethernet, and LCC can run on Ethernet and many other connection topologies as well. But CAN is even more robust, including some very neat data hierarchy to protect from noise and erroneous data. And it's a network, a series of independent nodes connected with RJ45, plain old Ethernet cables, available almost everywhere these days. I was also surprised to find that the CAN bus was not the only bus in our cars. Yes, I will freely admit that RR Circuits is right now the only manufacturer making a full line of LCC product, and I'm not in any way in their employ, but their product does what we need it to and is available now. Later, I will mention some of the products we have been teased with for future availability, not only from RR Circuits, but from some other major players as well. 
Dick Bronson of RR Circus is not only a really nice guy and a major proponent of LCC, but is incredibly helpful to folks like me doing a first setup and trying to understand a new way of doing things. He really knows all about LCC and is trying to produce what we want. The first LCC products were variations on products he had already developed for LocoNet, so it wasn't like they were reinventing the whole thing. Some of the options, for example, the board that drives eight tortoise outputs, have been a product for quite a while, and any contact closure will enable them. And he is adamant about how much better LCC is than LocoNet. So why LCC rather than just adding to the DCC cab bus? The LCC bus is a lot faster, so there's more space for data to zip back and forth. LCC over the CAN bus is capable of 125,000 bits per second, while DCC is only 8,000 bits per second. Once you get a lot of operators operating a lot of trains, especially with sound commands and perhaps a dispatcher looking at an occupancy map and throwing turnouts, the older DCC cab bus starts to get noticeably less responsive. So if that's where you're going, you might want to separate out all the unnecessary to train running information and set up a new bus, especially since the cab bus is now mostly wireless anyway and doesn't require as many fixed input panels as a completely wired control does. And it's an easy network to set up. You can get pre-made Cat5e or Cat6 cables in almost any length. And if you want to make custom cables, good ratchet crimping tools, wire, and RJ45 connectors are readily available from Home Depot and Lowe's, among many others. One of the neat things about LCC is that it's a network of nodes, which share data and power. So what's a node anyway? A node pretty much boils down to any circuit attached to a network electrically that produces or consumes events. What's an event? Event is something that happens, pretty much just like in the real world. An event produced in one node is instantly shared with all the other nodes on the network. That's the magic. An event is shared instantly with all of the nodes, and any nodes with consumers of that event are activated. Events in LCC are actually eight bytes of data, each byte being a word of eight bits. Thus, an event is 64 bits that zoom among the nodes. Fortunately, when using JMRI to configure LCC, initial values for event IDs are provided, and there are copy and paste buttons on each window, so you rarely have to type the bytes. For those of you interested in where the event IDs come from and what they mean, I will give some detail here. The rest of you just remember to copy and paste. Each node on the network comes from the factory with a completely unique binary identity code. That code becomes the basis for events sourced from that node. Event IDs that the node thoughtfully generates for us when we're setting up to produce or consume events. Here we can see that an event ID includes the manufacturer's ID and serial number of the node as well as two bytes to specify the event number. Now a little more detail on where those numbers and sometimes letters come from. Inside the electronics, these event IDs are a series of ones and zeros called bits that go to each node on the network. In order to define the individual bits, but not wanting to write all of the ones and zeros, they looked for a way to describe them. Early on, a group of eight bits called a byte was used to represent a single character of text, like the letter A, and the byte remains the smallest independent group of bits. However, there are 256 different options for the arrangement of single bits, ones and zeros, in a byte, so describing a byte was going to be difficult. The best way seemed to be dividing the byte into two four-bit pieces which each have only 16 arrangement options. But since we only have 10 digits representing numbers in our base 10 system, and we'd like to define each of those 16 options with a single digit, we will need to add some letters to the numbers to describe the 16 options. This use of 16 characters is called hexadecimal, or base 16, shortened to hex. In this chart, you can see the actual bit arrangement of the 16 options for each hexadecimal digit, and thus why you sometimes see letters when the event IDs are written down. 
But the really good news for us using LCC is that we don't really need to know anything about the letters and numbers or even where they came from. We just need to be able to copy and paste. On an LCC network, there will be nodes that create events, like from pushing a button. There will also be nodes that consume events, like when a tortoise driver sees a button push event and changes polarity to reverse the tortoise. The fun part is that these events could really be anything from button pushes and straightforward occupancy detection through signal logic and contact closures to control trackside signals, operate accessories, even room lights. Since the nodes, for the most part, get their power from the network, you only have to wire a single cat cable from one node to the next, up to 40 nodes on one leg, depending of course on the node's power requirements, like how many LEDs it's powering. That power comes from one of the two necessary non-nodes that are connected to the network, a dual powering module with one half amp output on each jack. This power supply can power a network of up to 25 tower LCCs on each leg, there are, of course, ways to link up networks, including over the internet, so there's really no limit on the total number of nodes. The second necessary non-node is the USB interface to the LCC network. While the PC attached through this USB interface, running JMRI or other LCC programs, is a node, the interface itself is not. It can't produce or consume events. One thing I will note as it came up when I was programming Jerry's system. There must be a minimum of two nodes for LCC to work. LCC wouldn't run after I removed my PC until I added a second tower of LCC to the network. My guess is that it needs something to talk to, and it's programmed to not talk to itself. The final hardware required for the LCC network is a termination at each end of the network. These properly terminate the network and reduce noise in the data. The RR circuit ones have LEDs that show power and data connections are active. At this point, I was able to make a general wiring diagram for Jerry's layout, showing typical tortoise wiring as well as a typical button, including the tables with pin number connections from RR circuits. On the left is the LCC network wiring. The left input-output 10-pin jack on the tower LCC IO number one is the one I'm using for the button input. The left table shows that 10 pin physically, so you know which input connects to which pin. All the buttons share the ground pin. The right input output 10 pin, IO number two, has the stall motor driver board attached with a provided ribbon cable from RR circuits. The stall motor driver board has two 10-pin jacks for output to the eight tortoises. The table below shows the output pin numbers, and below that, a layout of the pins. Two connections, identified as plus or minus, are connected to drive each tortoise, with a tortoise typical wiring shown. The tortoise also has two relays built in. We're using one to feed appropriate power to the switch's frog, and the other to feed an LED, or in the case of our staging yard, to feed a sequence of tortoise relays to ultimately light a completed root LED. Now for the actual wiring. Fortunately, Jerry made me a cart with all the various gauge wires on board. It's really not a big deal to add a node. Unplug the termination, add the cat cable for the new node, plug in the new node, and terminate the other jack. Done. The terminator, remember, includes LEDs to show the power and the data. Let's look at the intended layout and how each track is made active. At each end of the four track yard are three turnouts. The first chooses the front or rear two tracks, and the next two switch the individual track. So to access any specific track requires controlling two turnouts at each end, so four turnouts for each track. Fortunately, we want each end to basically do the same thing. So we could use one tortoise output to control a tortoise at each end at the same time. 
I checked with the RR circuits to make sure I could attach two tortoises to one output. Dick Bronson assured me that their stall motor driver has adequate output at 25 milliamps to drive two 10 milliamp tortoises. Now that I knew how they were going to be wired, I needed to determine what events needed to be created to operate them. First, some definitions, so what I create will be consistent and easy to understand later when repair or changes are required. So looking at the upper entrance to staging, I named the turnouts on this diagram. Switches A100 to 105 on the A side and B200 to 205 on the B side, and note each turnout's state. A turnout is normal when the straightest route is chosen and thrown when the diverging route is chosen. And yes, what is actually normal can be finally determined when physically attaching the two power wires to the tortoise. And if thrown command makes it normal, reversing those wires fixes it. I then created a spreadsheet with the states that I needed for this tower LCC. I like having all the necessary information in one place if possible, and this is for someone else, so documentation is somewhat more important. And again, there will be many more of everything, so starting organized bodes well for the future. When I created this, the event ID column was empty. I filled it in to keep a record after I used the event IDs provided by the software. The producers, in this case push buttons, are on the left, connecting through the event IDs that they produce in the center to consumers, in this case tortoises, on the right. Just like when configuring the node, I filled out the consumers, each turnout pair, and the activated states, normal and thrown, first. Then I could look at each track and its button and figure out which turnout needed to be normal or thrown and fill in the appropriate producer X's. When that button was pushed, the node would then produce the proper event IDs. Let's look at the first push button on the remote control panel called A1, which chooses the main line or outside track, conveniently also called A1. In order to access that track, both switch A100 and A101 have to be normal. And of course, their counterparts at the other end of the yard, A105 and A104, but they're wired together, so they appear together here. Looking down the producer's push button A1 column, at the far left, you can see two X's. If you follow the row for each of those X's to the right, you'll first see the event ID that they produce, followed by the action the tortoise will perform consuming those events. In this case, setting both front turnouts to normal, thus enabling that outside main track. The next track in from the main, A2, is chosen by the next push button producer, A2. That track also needs the A100-105 switches to be normal, but it differs in that the next turnout, A101-104, needs to be thrown. So the X moves down to produce the appropriate event ID to throw that turnout. By filling in all the appropriate Xs for all the rest of the buttons, I know which event IDs to copy and paste in each button's producer events. So I'm ready to configure that node. The node that's available now and makes this all happen is the RR Circuits Tower LCC. This node's 16 lines can be set up as either input or output lines on a line-by-line -line basis. There are two I.O. jacks available on the Tower LCC. Each one is a 10-pin jack allowing for eight I.O. connections and power and ground. So a single tower LCC can process a total of 16 lines made up of a combination of contact closure inputs and contact closure outputs. There are several accessory boards that can connect to the tower LCC's I.O. jacks, the servo switch machine controller we're using, as well as a solenoid switch machine driver, a relay board, several different signal driver boards, four aspect and searchlight versions, and occupancy detectors capable of remote sensing. Each of these uses one of the 10 pin IO connectors and therefore eight inputs or outputs. 
These I.O. connectors can also be connected to ribbon cable through inexpensive crimp-on connectors for real-world connections like buttons or lamps. If you use rainbow ribbon cable, you can easily tell which wire is which and get the right one on the right button. Otherwise, the first wire is identified and you have to count. RR Circuits has a wonderful breakout board converting the 10-pin header to screw terminals. Best $6 investment you can make. On Jerry's layout, a button will be used to choose each of the eight tracks available, so eight button inputs are needed on the tower LCC. We will be using the first 10-pin I.O. jack to connect buttons, and the second one will be used to attach the stall motor driver board. The buttons get ground from the 10-pin, and when activated, connect that ground to one of the input pins. And again, these inputs are held high internally, looking for that push button connecting the ground to indicate on. The button panel for each side includes four red buttons to choose tracks, with LEDs adjacent to show which track is active. The shiny toggle switches kill power to the non-mainline tracks, outside track is main. There is also a big red button and a blue LED connected to a volt scooter circuit breaker for the staging tracks, so a mistake placing an engine on staging tracks doesn't take down the whole layout. Unfortunately, the instructions said that we needed a button to break the circuit to reset it, but it turns out that the breaker resets adequately without a button, so we probably won't need these buttons anymore. On the back, you can see the heavy wires for track power passing through the volt scooter and the toggles. The LEDs come with red and green wires attached. The buttons have common ground on one side and a separate connection on the other. Ribbon cables connect the tower LCC to the stall motor driver board and then to a breakout board to make the actual tortoise connections. RR Circuits also makes a wonderful I.O. test board, a most helpful device. It has buttons and LEDs for each line, showing output and allowing input on each line, a most useful $8 device. With it, you can test inputs by pressing a button, that contact closure again, and view outputs with LEDs, as well as an LED that flashes to show that an event has occurred. It allows you to test the programming, create an input push button, see an output LED lights to see that your events are occurring properly, even before you actually attach the tortoises. Here's an example of the complete staging wiring, showing the red and black track wiring, including toggle switch track shutoffs. The tower LCC is shown wired, including buttons and tortoise connections. The panel LED wiring is included, passing through the tortoise's internal relays. I prefer this way of lighting the LEDs because it confirms that you actually have the, the tortoises in the right position. Otherwise, it also uses a, a logic line, and I'd just as soon not pay for that. The other relay contacts root frog power. At this point, we have a power network with terminations at each end, a tower LCC node or two, and a PC connected through the USB interface. The hardware is in place, so now we can configure it to produce and consume events. I'm going to show the options chosen and information entered to be able to automate a button and a switch driver so you know exactly what's involved and actually how simple it is. There is a lot of power in a tower LCC, just as it comes from RR circuits, but they've really made it easy to configure. One of the engineers writing the JMRI LCC code is Balaz Raths, a Google employee. He has incorporated Google-like search and dialogue in filling out the tables, and copy and paste are my friends. A little side note about the interoperability of the nodes. I have seen Balaz pull out a node that wasn't communicating properly and quickly program, in fact, an RR circuits replacement, literally in moments during a clinic at an NMRI national. Generally, the first step in configuring LCC nodes is running Panel Pro, part of the Java Model Railroad Interface, JMRI. There are help groups online to assist, so I'm not going to get too involved here with getting started. Yes, there are sometimes difficulties starting up the first time, mostly Windows or Mac unpleasantness, finding the right port, etc. But with group and personal help, it's actually not difficult to get going, and most get going with no problem at all. 
At least the LCC buffer is a direct USB connection and should at least show up. You know, it doesn't require you an RS-232 adapter or anything else. When I've had trouble reattaching to the LCC network, I've been directed to Panel Pro Preferences to make sure that the connections are correct using the USB buffer. And under defaults, you will need to have Open LCB connect to the throttles by clicking that circle. So what is this Open LCB, and why isn't it just called LCC? Well, before there was LCC, there was a working group called Open Local Control Bus, and they worked out code to control a lot of different things. The NMRA's LCC uses only a portion of their code, which is capable of much more. Click on the Open LCB tab on the Panel Pro page, and there are several options, including a traffic monitor that creates a list of all events as they occur. But we'd like to look at the nodes, so click Configure the Nodes. I have already configured these nodes, so they will already be filled. A pop-up with the Open LCB Network tree opens up, and we can see the two tower LCC nodes that I've already named. We're going to look at Staging A. So after clicking on that, we can see a lot of information about that node. We want to open Configuration Dialog, so... Here are the five pages of screenshots that make up the entire configuration dialog. There's a lot of power here, and I'm sure I'll learn a lot more about what it can do as I enter the signaling world, but fortunately for right now, the basic configuring of buttons and tortoises happens at the very top. So we'll start there, and for now ignore the incredible capability of the rest. The first blanks that are filled in are the node name and description. These are to help you find a specific node and they appear on the network tree, so choose well. We're going to cover this in the order that makes the most sense. Load the consumers, tortoises, and then cut and paste the producers, buttons. So for Jerry's system, the consumers are attached to IO number two and thus have lines from nine to 16. Here we'll look at line nine, which configures switch A100 and A105 the first switch is coming into the A yard from either end. We got to line nine by sliding the select one input output line until line nine is highlighted. Directly below is the IO line description, which as you see also appears in the line tab above. This is a consumer and does generate an output function, so steady active high is chosen to cause the tortoise to go to a position and stay there. This line is not a producer, so the input function is disabled. Next, we'll move down the page to the commands section. At the top is consumer commands, what we're dealing with for this line, and you will find an event ID already in this window, generated by the system. You generally don't need to type in one of these long numbers. Copy and paste what's given to you. I'll demonstrate that in a minute. Below commands is indications, including producer commands. This line is a consumer, so none producer commands. Focusing on the consumer commands, there are six events associated with this line. We only need two, basically tortoise normal or thrown. Looking at event one, we see an event ID that causes the output to be on, active. In this case, tortoise normal. As you fill out the programming, the other places that use that event are listed. Thank you, JMRI programmers. So if we have an event to normal the tortoise, we'll also need an event to throw the tortoise. In this case, event two sets the line off or inactive. Remember that both of these states are being supplied to a stall motor driver that reverses the voltage feeding the tortoises, depending on their on or off state. And if you get the normal and thrown reversed, you can just reverse the wiring. We only need two events for a tortoise, so event three is none, even though it has a unique event ID. We'll go back to event one to demonstrate copying an event ID. I have clicked copy here and the display responded with copied. Now I go to event three to paste the event ID and it appears orange to tell me that it's on the display but not loaded into the node. So you must push right to load it into the node and the window will change to white. Now that we have a consumer, let's configure a producer button. 
Select Input Output Line 1 and describe it. In this case, choose Staging A1 Main. Note that there is no output function, and the input function has been chosen to be active low. Remember our button push contact closure makes ground when pushed, so active low. It's normally at plus voltage, so inactive high. Now we'll go down to the commands section. Again, not a consumer, so none. On the producer commands section, I have chosen input on as the action, the button being pressed, and I have pasted the event ID that we just defined for the A100-105 Tortoise's consumer into event 1. In order to make the outside track active, requires the A101, A104 tortoises to be set normal, so the button must also send an event ID for that, loaded into event 2. Now that the commands are entered into the node, you can disconnect the laptop and just let the system run on its own, generating and consuming events. Of course, right now the generating is limited to 8 push buttons, and the consuming is limited to 12 tortoises, but it only gets bigger from here. I did mention the future, and here that involves semaphore signals. You can, of course, control semaphores with tortoises, and Jerry has a few of them on the shelf. Controlling tortoises for semaphores would be much like controlling them for turnout control, but wouldn't this be a perfect place to use servos? With servos, you can control both speed and final angle, both really useful in replicating a semaphore's action. Here's my UNO you know, test picture from NMRA's National in Orlando, where I learned how to program servos with Arduino. So that's one way, and I know that many are using Arduinos and the like for extending LCC. Also, Tam Valley Depot does have a servo controller that could be used driven by a tower LCC or a signal LCC. But even better, I found out from Dick Bronson that RR Circuits has a brand new servo board. In fact, here's a, a view of the circuit board, so it's really a near product. He also mentioned RR Circus is developing a tortoise driver to mount right on the tortoise and use the 10 pin cable to interconnect. You can choose which pin controls that tortoise. Another very exciting thing for those of us with Digitrack systems, there is an LCC LocoNet gateway. Speaking of LCC gateways, there has been much excitement about Train Control System's new, almost released, command station, which includes an LCC node especially when combined with their now-released Wi-Fi throttle. You can rename LCC consumers from the throttle and directly control turnouts, etc. So you can get the switch and occupancy detection off the DCC bus, yet still have direct control from your handheld. The future is fun. The good news is that many companies and individuals are developing products for this new standard network joining the few trailblazers that are already making this happen. I am happy to make Jerry's layout one of the first to take advantage of this latest NMRA boom. Looks like I'll be back soon to extend that LCC network node to node. There's a lot more work to be done.
Now I'd like to show you some of the progress that Jerry has made since most of these slides were shot over a year ago. He made a drawer for the LCC components for this staging yard so it would be possible to access them after the track above was installed. Peninsula is with his unique X supports with laser leveled L girders to support the various levels of track he intends. The beautiful spline roadbed, including easements into nice wide radius curves. And hopefully you'd like to see a bit more of the trains behind me. So here are some shots of my layout. 